Okay, I got another Godwin for you today. Today's title is called Kissed by Judas. And then the uh, (laughs) subtitle is Betrayed by Your Own Creation. (laughs) So, who here has ever experienced being betrayed by someone you love? Okay, great. That's, is that everybody? Everybody but Michael. Oh, Michael. Okay, we got Michael. Okay, great. Thank you. Who here would love to be loved without any fear of ever being heard again? Say aye. Aye. All right. That's what we're stepping into today. So everybody say, I'm done being kissed by Judas. I'm done being, by Judas. I'm done being betrayed. I'm done, being I'm done betraying myself. I'm done betraying, myself. I'm done betraying God. I'm done betraying God. I'm ready to be kissed by love. All right, so we can't talk about, you know, being betrayed without uh, bringing up Matthew 26. This is where it all happened. Matthew 26, this is all about Judas. So, again, the title is Kissed by Judas. So, I'm sure probably most everybody here has heard this story from Judas. I'm sure everybody's heard it, but just in case, we'll read it where it came from. This is Matthew 26, 47 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. A large mob with swords and clubs was with him from the chief priests and elders of the people. His betrayer had given them a sign. The one I kiss, he's the one. Arrest him. So again, Judas is, he's one of Jesus' disciples. He's, you know, one of the, he's the treasurer. He's supposed to be there supporting the mission. And he, uh... For a bag of gold or something like that, just some, you know, a little bit of worthless nothing that uh, looked like something awesome to him. Ooh, wow, you big give me some money? All I got to do is tell you, betray Jesus? Okay, well, great, let's do that. So he says, I'm going to kiss the one, I'm going to kiss the one who you're, you want to, uh, uh, the bad guy, which is Jesus. And so when I kiss him, that's the one you arrest him. So he went straight right up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Friend, Jesus asked him, why have you come? Then they came up, took a hold of Jesus, arrested him. At that moment, one of those with Jesus reached out his hand and, uh, where, I lost this, reached out his hand and drew his sword. He struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. That was Peter. Peter cut off this guy's ear uh, to try to save Jesus. Like, oh no, uh, am I, am I, did we lose Zoom? Are they still on there, you guys? Hello? So that, is my recording still going? Okay, well, we're going to keep going then because the people on YouTube are going to be watching this, but uh, all my people live online will be coming back on. So, but we're going to keep going. So, uh, so P- Peter chopped off Jesus, or uh, Peter chopped off this dude's ear because he was trying to protect Jesus but from, you know, getting taken, o- taken away and murdered. And uh, so then Jesus told him, Peter, he says, put your sword back in its place because all who take up a sword will perish by a sword. Oh, you like that? Mm-hmm. Um, several of the casitas don't have it, and just now my we're internet back. went down, and I'm we, positive we, that the internet went down again. We're back. At the central, so thank you for hanging can in you, there. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right, we're back. Not sure what happened there, but uh, back. So uh, we we're just talking about how uh, when the when they. Judas betrays Peter with the kiss. And, I mean, Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss, and then the guys go to take Jesus, and then Peter chops off the dude's ear with a sword, and then Jesus says, uh, put your sword back in its place, because all who take up a sword will perish by a sword. Uh, and then he says, or do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will provide me at once more than 12 legions of angels? So now he's like, dude, Peter, come on. you." I, who do you think you're protecting right now? You've obviously forgotten who I am if you think that you need to protect me because I could call up, I could talk to my father and he could send down 12 legions and stop this whole thing. So stop stopping what God has got planned, Peter, okay? Relax. And then he goes on to say, how then, like if I were to call on God, my father, and tell him to stop all this, 
how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? And he's talking about in the Old Testament, the Jew, all the, the Jewish traditions and everything they were sharing, they were prophesying about Jesus way back when. And so this, like, Jesus fulfills all the prophecies of the Messiah that the Jews were waiting for. And so it has to go down this way. Otherwise, God's a liar. And God's not a liar. God cannot lie. So this is the way that it has to be because this is what God said was going to happen when the Messiah shows up. So um, if I were to call on the Father and get the Father to stop it, which I could, if I were to do that, then I would no longer be the Messiah. I would no longer be the one that they're waiting for. I would no longer be the one who can actually save them from their suffering. So it has to go this way. And so stop trying to stop what God's got planned, Peter. So how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must be this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I used to sit teaching in the temple complex and you did not arrest me. But all this has happened so that the prophetic scriptures would be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, which is also, you know, that's what part of the prophecy. Uh, everybody's going to turn against him. Everybody's going to betray him. So Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. Son of God and son of man. So he's 100% God. So all of man is his creation. So right there, being betrayed by his own creation. But uh, what we miss is how often we, anytime we're betrayed, it's actually our own creation that we're betrayed by. And that's what we're going to really start to open up here in this, uh, in this message today. But uh, yeah, how's that? You know, he's, he's done nothing but good the whole time. He's been uh, teaching, and they, not, they haven't t turned him in. Or, uh, but now all of a sudden, he's getting turned in. And they're thinking, you know, they're thinking they're, they've got him. Got your ass. But he's like, dude, this is what God said was going to happen. You don't have anything. You're actually, you, God's got you, actually. And God's doing this whole thing to actually liberate you. The ones who are trying to murder me, y'all the ones that need to be set free. I don't need to get set free from you. You need to be get set free by me, and that's why I'm going, is for you. So, but then, you know, it is wild, you know, these disciples, he's got these 12 that he's been working with this whole time, and here comes the moment. He's been telling the whole time. The Bible, because they, they, before they even met Jesus, they were all Jews. All the disciples were Jews before they met Jesus, so they already knew the whole plan, like, from the, b before, like, the, was saying that, you know, the Messiah is going to have to get ripped to shreds. Basically, this is what's going to go down. So they already knew that. And then he shows up. I'm the Messiah. And so they've been with him, watching him do all the miracles. And he's saying, hey, I'm going to go, I'm going to the cross. But they just couldn't believe it all that time. And they still didn't believe it they, until he goes to the cross. And then even after he goes to the cross, then he, he goes and dies. And then he comes back. And they still don't believe it. There's Mary and some other women saw Jesus after he came back. And Mary goes back to the disciples and said, hey, Jesus is back. And they're like, yeah, right. That's not true. So all that time, they still didn't believe it until they saw him. And then they're like, oh. And then after that, and so again, we talk about how like, Jesus is a historical figure. It's a historical fact that Jesus actually walked the earth. What they don't have actual historical proof of outside of the scriptures, like everything, all the other stuff about Jesus, it's, it's outside the scriptures, not just in the Bible. There's historical data, much more historical data than, than Julius Caesar ever existing that Jesus actually walked the earth. He actually did go to the, to the cross, but there's not historical data that he uh, that they can prove that he actually resurrected. Except for the fact that all the disciples that were with him all this time turned away from him before he went to the cross to save their lives. But then after he died, and then they say he came back, after that they all gave up their lives. They all, all of them got slaughtered. Even worse, they're like, hey, I don't even deserve to be slaughtered like he was slaughtered. I, I, I deserve to be slaughtered even worse than he was. You don't just do that. You don't just die like that for a lie. They, like, they would not have done that because they would have done what they were doing before, which was just, hey, I don't know that dude. They could have just kept doing what they were doing before he died. I don't know that dude. I'm never, never, no, not, that's, I'm not the, no, that's not my guy. But it, so he, it's, it's impossible that he did not actually return, resurrect, because 
all these disciples going to their death after they had already ran away, that would never have happened. There had, something happened in between uh, them running away before he died and then them coming straight to their death for him. The only thing that could have happened is that he actually did resurrect. He actually did come back. And they were sold on it. So, um, uh, we watched the movie Braveheart last night here at the village, and uh, it was so good. It was such a, such a God movie there. I mean, all, I, I find every single movie except for Mad Max, is, I, <laughs> I, I find extraordinary golden. Okay. I couldn't really. The only thing I found in Mad Max was at the very beginning. He says, "I can't tell if, if who's if if the whole world is is crazy. If I'm crazier than the whole world, or the whole world is crazier than me. <laughs> but one of them is one of them." <laughs> and so, uh, but anyway, Braveheart was was really awesome. And um, as I was watching, there were so many times where uh, he got betrayed William Wallace he got betrayed and it like was bringing stuff up with me and I, I've had this whole betrayal thing going out through my life for <laughs> quite a minute now uh, my best friends they all just turn against me you know I even have just recently it was interesting and I, uh, I, I dude this come in here I welcome him with open arms that he ain't got no money he ain't got no friends he ain't got no nothing and I come in, well, I give him my mama's house, and I'm just take care of him. We send him on a beautiful two-week vacation, just give him pure love. And the dude just, I'm giving my whole heart, and he just snaps, and out of nowhere, and just run. It's not that he just turns away. He turns away, shooting flame and arrow, just making up crazy stuff in his head and shooting it, telling the whole world about how horrific. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty. I did it again. I, I pulled it off again. Somehow. I managed to do that once, once again. I thought I was done with that. I guess I wasn't done with it. I might have been tired of it, but I guess I wasn't done with it just yet. Because I pulled it off one more time, getting my, somebody that I gave my whole heart to and love just turning and, you know, doing something like that. So, uh, so yeah, you know, I've been, and that was a couple weeks ago. So I've been looking at it like, okay, what is that? You know, taking responsibility for it and everything. And then, but when we watched Braveheart last night, uh, there's these times where William Wallace, like he's, you know, he's Braveheart. He's got his whole heart into it. And I'm like, yeah, that's the way that I operate. That's the way I live. I put my whole heart into it. And uh, so he's standing for something. And then he's standing for freedom. That's his, that's his jam, freedom. And, uh, and he's doing great. He's got all the people on board. Everything's going great. And they are standing for their freedom. And then the only thing that took him down, he got betrayed. He had this guy that he looked him in the eyes and he's like, dude, I see, I see greatness in you, brother. I believe in you, man. And, and he, he shakes hand with the guy like, come on, you're going to be there on the battlefield? Are we going to do this? You know, that's the warrior's promise. Like on, that, on this day, when, when we go on that battle, on that day, I will stand my ground. That's the warrior. What you can count on is I, you can't, I can't promise you we're going to win, but I promise you I'm going to be on, on that battlefield until it's over. If either I die or we win, but I'm not running off that field, leaving, abandoning you. That's the warrior's promise. And I've had so many people show up in my life that make that promise. And then we don't even get into battle. We're just in practice and they take off running. I'm like, where did you go, dude? <laughs> We're just in practice right now. We, I'm, glad I, I'm glad we got that handled while we're in practice before we actually get to the, where we're going, man. Daggum. So I'm glad to find out soon, you know, early, early on. Now, what I've also noticed is every time that happens, the role that that person was playing always gets filled pretty much immediately with, the, uh, well, as soon as I do the work, taking the responsibility, cleaning, you know, getting my lesson, doing whatever the thing, then it opens the spot for, you know, who God actually already had planned in, in the beginning for that role. And, he, and, and I get upgraded every single time. Every time we, we get b- betrayed, there's always, God's always got a plan. And it was never a betrayal. It was all part of God's plan the entire time. Um, so, but anyway, uh, so the warrior's from, I want, you know, I'll be on that battlefield. And so you got all these people that, you know, because you know William Wallace is going to be there. Like you, everybody knows he's going to be there. He, he, he ain't running. <laughs> he's not going to run away. He'll run towards. And so uh, he, they go to this battle, and they're, they got, everything's going great. They go to this battle, and then him and his core group, they come running. They go in, 
and it was all part of a plan. And then there was these other two that, that were supposed to come in after. And so they're, they're going in, William Wallace and his, his team of you know, core group, the ones that are full, wholehearted, they're going in, getting it done, and it's working. And then it's time for the, the other two groups to come in. And, and while William brings up the flag just at the perfect time, like... And he looks back, and they're supposed to come in and do their thing. And he's like, and he's waving the flag. And, and he sees them, both, both the two groups, just ride off on their horses away. And he's like, what? And it's like, he just can't even believe it because, because he would never do something like that. And so you're looking at this, these people like, I would never do anything like that. I can't, like, I can't even imagine how anybody could do it because, you know, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are, and that's how we get betrayed so many times because we're, you know, we're, 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 we're proje- it's all projection. We're projecting on the world around, and we're not even seeing reality. So we're, we're seeing people a lot higher than they actually are a lot of times. Or we're seeing people a lot lower than they are. So, um, you know, he's, he's like, there's no way possible that these dudes are going to turn their back on me. And they dang sure do. Right at the moment that it was time and they were going to win. And so now the, they're getting slaughtered now. William Wallace and all of his people are getting slaughtered. But then he see, William sees the king ride off of the other, uh, the other group, uh, the, the ones that are slaughtering them. And, and even though he's got, already got an arrow in his chest and he breaks the thing off and he's like, Ugh. and he gets up and he's like, you know, we're done. We're, we're all going to lose, but I'm going to get that guy. And cause the dude starts riding off because he thinks it's already over. He's like, we've already whipped these dudes. There ain't no, he's like, bring me William Wallace, you know, you dead or alive. I mean, bring him alive if you can, but dead's fine too. doesn't really matter. And then he rides off because it's like, he knows it's over. And it would be over if you didn't have somebody with the heart, with the brave heart like William Wallace. It would have been done. But because his heart's so strong and he's, coming, he's fighting for the right reasons, there's a, there's a supernatural power in him because it's not for him. It's not for his ego. It's not for his little significance. And so he stands up and he, he chases down the dude riding off and he's got his, his crew. And as he chases him down... He's about to catch up, and then the, uh, these two turn around on the horses, and the one says to the other guy, protect the king. And so this guy comes, and he attacks William, uh, but William h- handled it and took the guy down, and then the guy's helmet comes off. And then what does William see? Who is it? It's the guy that he just shook hands with that he saw the greatness in. I, I, I see the greatness in you. you you're a great man. You're, 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 you're a great man. You're a good man. You do the things for the right reason. And, and he just, it, you, you, there's a scene in the movie where just, like I was talking to Mel about last night, she hadn't seen that movie in, what, 15, 20 years or something. But she remembers this moment in the scene, this scene because she's like, I remember his eyes. Like, the, just the betrayal because he just, he just can't even believe it. He's already, like, got the the arrow in him, but like that doesn't matter. Nothing, but what mattered to what broke his heart, what broke him was looking at this guy that he had just shook hands with, that he saw the greatness in. Yeah. Arrow in his heart. Yeah. But that didn't matter that the arrow was in his heart. What mattered, what hurt was that this man that he believed in betrayed him. Oh, and bef- by the way, before that, even before they went to the battle, there was William and his crew and then the other two crews and then the, the other dude that he, William had shook hands with that was supposed to come in, uh, they said, he's not here. And William's like, he'll be here. And they're like, no, he's not here. He's like, no, he'll be here. Because cause William would be there. He assumes this dude will as well. And the guy shook his hand and everything. Now the guy really did want, because what he saw in the guy, it was real. But the problem was the guy was still, like when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you got to hate your family. Because, you know, we grew up in this world and, and we're so in, programmed and we're, you know, we, we, we've created these identities for ourselves based upon our relationship to other fictional characters called our mom, our dad, our brothers and our sisters. And so it's a fictional identity working with other fictional identities. So you, that's why Jesus like, you have to, you got to hate your mom. You got to hate your, your children. You got to hate your whole family. You got to hate your life because other than that, you're doing it all for the wrong reasons. You've got to be able to, you know, I always say, you know, people talk about, I'm gonna give my life to God, but 
But the thing is, like, you're not, I always say you can't give away something you don't have. They don't even have their life yet because they're teachers, preachers, friends, family, media, government, all these, this programming, all these relationships have them. So they're like, most people think they're giving their life to God. They, they haven't done it because they're, they're so conditional. It's like, they're just saying that so they go, okay, check, got that done. Now, now I'm a good person and now I can go back and keep doing what I've been doing all, all my life anyway. But that's not the whole purpose. Like, it's, it's a complete transformation. You were born first of flesh and then born, born second of spirit. When you, it's, it's, you're born again. It's not you anymore. Like, you're, the, the you that gets born again is not a child of your mom and dad. It is not uh, r- blood related to your brother and sister. You're related to your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's, it's we're one spirit. And so it's a transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a complete transformation. You're a complete, you have a new mind. Uh, you're a new being. And who you once were, that's not who you are anymore. It never was in the, in the first place. And, you know, Jesus says, if you want to follow me, you, you know, you need to count the cost. You know, people say they want to follow me, but like only a fool would start to build a building without counting the cost. Otherwise, they're going to be halfway done and just look like an idiot because they ran out of resources and now they're worse off than before they started back in all this debt. So he's like, what's it cost to follow me? Everything. And he's not joking. He went first. He's like, I'm, I'm going. I'm showing you the way. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your wants, your desires, your preferences, you got to lay it all down. And so, um, why was I talking about that? Uh, we were talking about William and then follow. Oh, oh yes, because, because the dude that William shook hands with, like he's looking at this guy and, and it was actually, he saw the guy. He, he was actually accurate. When he saw what was real inside of this dude, he was accurate. But what he missed was that the dude was still too, under too much influence of his family, of his dad. His dad was still influencing him. So, he, had a, he, didn't, he didn't do the step of hating his family just yet. So he wasn't free just yet. You know, even, you know, the Bible talks about, Jesus says, you, once you, you're supposed to leave and cleave. You, you grow up in your family, but then you're supposed to, as a, you know, as a son, when you become born again, and then you get moved out of your family, and you're going to create a new family, and two become one flesh when you find your wife, and the two come together. A man, one man and one woman come together, and, and they have a family. Now, he, now, this man is now the king of, of, his, of his family because he submitted to the king of kings. And it's a whole new... Other, so he's like, it's called leave and cleave. You're, you're leaving the, other, the, the previous family um, so you can actually birth your family, create your family that it's the unique expression of it that God's using you for. And because the, the purpose of your family is to serve God for God's glory. That's the purpose of your marriage. That's the purpose of your family. That's the purpose of your life. And so God's got a plan for all of it. And so uh, this guy had not done the leave and cleave just yet. He's still under, you know, and that's the way it was back, back in, it's because it was a kingdom, but it's, they were, he was, a, he was a prince about to become a king inside of a kingdom that was not God's kingdom. Now, we are all princes and, pr- princes and princesses that are meant to be kings and queens, but we don't have to wait. You don't have to wait for some to inherit something or, or somebody. To, you did have to wait for somebody to die, but it's not your parents that you have to wait to die. You, well, we didn't have to wait for anybody to die because Jesus already died. Because it's just, we're just waiting on you to receive the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Once you receive the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you inherit your crown. You inherit your kingdom. You, get your, you, get to be, you become a king or a queen, a king of your thing or the queen of your scene under sub- submission, placing yourself under the authority of, of, of the king of kings. And so, uh, but this dude uh, was still under the influence of his dad. And so his dad influenced him to turn on William Wallace. And so William's sitting there on the battle, swearing this dude's going to be there. But he's like, he's not going to be here. But William's like, yes, of course he will, because I know I saw it in him. And then uh, turns out he wasn't there. And then, but the, what was crazy is not, the dude was on the battlefield, but he was on the other side. And that, so when William saw that, it just shattered him. Like that hurt way more than an arrow in his heart was this man that he believed in.
Yeah, the other guy betrayed himself. Yes, yes. So then later on, the guy, so just like in, in the Bible with Judas, what does Judas do after he betrays Jesus? He goes and kills himself because we're not punished for our sin, we're punished by our sin. So in order to betray someone, you must first have to betray yourself. But before you even betrayed yourself, there was one more thing that you had to do before that. You had to have betrayed God. You can't even betray, you can only betray yourself by betraying God. Like you have to betray God first. So you're like, okay, I'm leaving God. And then once you betray God, then the next step is you betray yourself. And then the next step is you betray someone else. And you're just, break, heart's breaking everywhere. And so uh, the guy felt really bad afterwards. And he just like couldn't even live. He just couldn't even live with himself anymore. And so he goes to his dad. He's like, never again. Never again will I be on the wrong side. And he makes this vow. And he means it. And then uh, William Wallace, he comes back around. He doesn't actually die. And he rebuilds himself, builds his army. Everything's going great. Uh, but there's like this last battle or something they've got to do. And, and he, needs, he needs support. And this guy that betrayed him once before sends for him, says, hey, I'm, I'm ready to support you. I'm ready to be on your team. And then the other people are like, no, dude, he's, he already lied to you once. He's going to betray you again. You can't trust him. But William Wallace is a brave heart. He is willing to open his heart over and over again. And I remember uh, about a year ago, I, we were, I think it was like at a Remember experience. Uh, it was the first time I'd heard Kirk say this, but it's just stuck with me ever since. Um, he said, uh, basically, I, I, I pray that you, f you, ha you find a purpose that's worth getting your heart broken o broken." over and over again for. And um, because what's happening when your heart's getting broken, it's not your heart's being broken, it's your expectations are being broken. And when your expectations are being broken, it's actually the shell that's around your heart is being broken open. But you keep gluing it back together. Keep it broken open. Let it keep breaking open because it's just the expectations. It's the conditions that you've placed upon love that are being broken. Not love is, love is not being broken. Somebody might say, you broke love for me. Or you might say to somebody else, you broke love for me. You might think somebody could break love. You, you broke my heart, which means you broke love. I'm never going to give love a chance again because of how much you hurt me. They didn't break love. They broke your conditions upon love. And that's what we're going to be opening up as we go along. This is, this is the, the important point that you've got to get because you've been betrayed by your own creation. The only thing you can ever get betrayed by is your own creation. And so... Um, uh, betraying him of himself. So the guy says, I'm never going to do this again and never going to be on the wrong side again. He says, William, I'm, I'm, and he sends the messenger to, to William. And then the people are like, no, man, he's going to betray you again. And, and, and William's like, dude, if like, we have to give it a chance. We have to go for it. Yeah, it's possible this dude's going to betray me again. But I believe, I, I, I believe, I, I know I saw something real in that man. I knew, I know I saw a man of integrity inside of there. And I believe that he means well and he's going to do the right thing this time. And the, other, or they're, the others are kind of like worried about, no, man, we don't, you know, we don't want to die. And he's like, dude, we're dead already. If we don't do this, like, what happens if we, don't, if we don't take this chance? And the guy's like, nothing. He says, exactly. We're going to remain slaves. We can't do this. It's out of integrity. We cannot betray ourselves. I don't, I don't, I would much rather get betrayed than betray myself. Because once you betray yourself, it's over. You're done. Until you undo it. Un, you know, you can't undo it, but, but you can head, you know, make a new decision and become a new person. And so, um, then William Wallace is coming in and the guy is there and they see each other and they're so happy. William's like, wow, it, you know, he knows this guy, mean, he means it this time. And the guy's like, William, yes, we're about to do this. But then there was other dudes there that had gotten with the dude's dad and wound up betraying William Wallace. And they, t you know, took him down and then this is how he gets stage set for. If you, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I'm spoiling the whole thing for you, but it's fine. You can still, I already knew the, how the movie went. I've watched it before and it's still amazing watching it again last night. <laughs> so, so uh, then, the, so now they actually take William to his death. 
But before he goes to his death, there's this, this princess that had fallen in love with him, and she's like looking out for him, and, uh, and she goes and meets him while he's in the, in the prison and said, uh, hey, what'd she say? She said, um, oh yeah, she was pleading him to beg for mercy. If you'll beg for mercy, maybe you can live. Maybe they'll, you know, put you in this little cage over here and you can stay in this little cage because they'll give you mercy and you can stay in the cage and then we get to be with each other. And, and <laughs> woo um, Oh, but before like one of William's first fights, because the whole point is he never betrayed himself. He might have been betrayed, but the most important thing is he never betrayed himself. Um, and, but he got all the people on, on board to fight with him he says, because the people were about to betray themselves. They, they've been slaves. They were, um, anytime they get married, these dudes could, these nobles could come in and the nobles uh, get to have sex with the, with the man's wife. Like he's the first one. Like the, the man doesn't have to get to have sex with his own wife until after this noble has sex with him, with, with her. So, uh, yeah, like that's complete betrayal, but they, that's what they had to do. That's like, you know, in order to survive. Otherwise, this army would just kill them. So this, this is their only chance is they have to betray themselves over and over and over. And William's like, I'm done. Can't do this ever again because they actually killed it because he had married his wife in secret. They killed his wife. And so he's like, okay, this is it. And so he, he gets them all on board, but, but then they see the, the army's there and then this other one comes and they're like, there's way too many, man. We can't. We, there's no way we're going to win this. And they're all turning away to run. And so then William Wallace gets up on there in front of everybody. He's like, and he says, I fight and you might die. You're right. There's a good chance you're going to die if you fight. Run and you'll live at least a while. And that's true. He kept talking about it. everybody dies. People are like, you're gonna, you might die. He's like, dude, everybody dies. It's not that I might die, I will die. The only question is, how and why did I die? And so, run and you'll live at least a while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that one for one chance, just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. Freedom! <laughs> yeah. And that's where, if y'all haven't been to the Remember Experience, I, we get the dudes scre- yell out freedom, and then the women start cheering, and yay! And that's where it came from. It literally came from that scene right there. So, uh, so it, it's all about betrayal of yourself. It's like, sure, the world can betray you all at once, but there, it, it, don't betray yourself, and most importantly, don't betray God, because the only way you can ever betray yourself is if you've betrayed God. You stay connected with God, you're going to stay connected with yourself. And even if the world is betraying you, it doesn't matter. You're not losing yourself. You're only losing what you're not. You're losing the conditions that you've placed upon love. You're losing your expectations. Are we following right now? We're going to go deeper in that. We're going to really open this thing up. This is all setting the stage, preparing for a big revelation for you to be liberated, to be set free from, from your, your betrayal, your illusions. And so... Uh, so yeah, she, uh, he's about to die, and the princess who loves him, I love you so much, please, no, don't, play, beg for mercy so he can save your life. And he said, if I swear to them, if I beg for mercy, then all that I am is dead already. Like everything that he is, like is dead already. He's, he's going to have to betray himself in order to do that. And that's who he is. That's what he stands for. Like he is, he would die, you know. And just like when Jesus said, I didn't, I'm not coming here to con- condemn and judge these people. They're, you're condemned already. You're condemned already. You're dead already. I'm not coming to kill anybody. I'm coming to heal people that are dead already. You're already dead because you've already betrayed God. And you've already betrayed yourself. I'm here to give you a way home. And so, we're dead already, just like if William Wallace would have bowed to these people, he'd be dead already. Each one of us have bowed to our flesh. Each one of us are dead already because we turned away from God and we bowed to our flesh. We bowed to our pleasures. We bowed to our egos, every single one of us. So we're dead already. 
But thank God for God. He sent a way for us to come home. Uh, so when you know who you are, no one can take that from you. But you can only know who you are when you know whose you are. If you don't know whose you are, you don't know who you are. There are people will interpret art, artwork, and they'll look at the artwork, and they're like, this is what I think the guy meant. And this is like, no, no, this is what he meant. And they're all interpreting this artwork, but you only know for show if you go to the, the creator of the art. That's the only way to know for show. We are all artwork. We're all masterpieces because we're pieces of the master. And he created us perfectly for perfect purpose. But only he knows what that is for us. We don't even know that for ourselves. The creation doesn't know what it is. The creator only knows what it is. And so we are created by the creator to be creators. We were made to make stuff, created to create stuff. But we don't even know what unique aspect of God that we are, the, di the d divine ray of light that comes through us. We don't know what that is. And we don't know who we are until we know whose we are. And so when we don't know whose we are, we've betrayed God. The only reason we don't know who we are is because we betrayed God. And you betrayed God for your flesh, for your desires, for your pleasures, for what you wanted, for what your ego t sold you. And so when you know who you are, no one can take that from you. Only what you're not can be betrayed by what you're not. So the only, if you're, if you're ever, cause, so as I was doing this breakthrough stuff about the whole betrayal thing, I'm like, damn, I did it again. I did it again. And I'm like, so what is it? What am I missing here? And then I realized there's this, this phrase that I say quite often because I hear people all the time saying, I'm not being heard. I'm not being seen. I'm like, if you're, if you're, if you're not feeling heard, it's because you're not listening. If you're not feeling seen, it's because you're not seeing. And so I realized, I'm like, oh, I feel betrayed. I feel, oh, I feel betrayed. Oh, so there's some, that's where it is. That's where the, there's something in there. Because I feel betrayed one more time, that's what's in there. there there's some sort of lie in my eye, fear in my ear, judgment in my heart, because it ha I feel it one more time. And, and then I'm like, that's the problem, that I feel betrayed, which means I'm being betrayed by my own creation because I can't actually be betrayed. That's just an illusion that I made up. And so what it is, is who I'm not is being betrayed by the projection, the reflection of the projection of itself. Who I'm not is being betrayed by who they're not. It's just, reflections, it's just reflections of projections. It's a projection of who I'm not. Still, there's still that aspect of my mirror staring, staring at me. So again, you can, if you ever feel unheard, it's because you're not listening. There is, you, there is no such thing as not being heard. God hears you. There's no such thing as not being seen. God sees you, but you're just not listening to God. You're just not seeing God. You're looking away and who you're not is looking at its mirror and it's blocking who you are and whose you are. You can't even see God because you got all this stuff layered in between you and God. There's a gap between you and God and you filled it with a bunch of nonsense. You fear, filled it with lies, fears, and judgments. Fear, false evidence appearing real. You've made up a whole bunch of stuff. You've made yourself God. You put on the judge hat and you're judging the creation. The creation, you're judging the circumstances, which is how Gad and Eve kicked themselves out of the garden because they bit into the knowledge of good and evil. They took the judgment hat. I know what good is and I know what evil is, so now I'm like God. But God already created everything and he said it's all good. So there is no evil except for our own creation. We created evil and we're betrayed by our own creation. We made it up. So uh, only what you're not can get betrayed by what you're not. I need to bring that back around. At the bit. Remind me to say that at the end again, because it's going to mean more to you as we go through this journey, that only what you're not can be betrayed by what you're not. So your ego is Judas. So it appears without, though it is within. You're looking at your mirror. You know, Jesus is the son of God. 
but we're all children of God. So Jesus is our mirror as well, but he's the truthful, he's the one that represents the truth. Everything else is lies and illusions. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. He is the truth. Jesus, the, there's nothing in Jesus that does not come from God. The only difference between us and Jesus now is in us and him, there's nothing else. He, he doesn't have all the lies and the fears and the judgments and all, all the stuff. He's just the truth. He's just pure, unconditional love. What kind of love? Unconditional love. Doesn't matter what the conditions are, he's still in love. If you squeeze an orange, what comes out? Orange juice. Squeeze a lemon, what comes out? Lemon juice. If you get squeezed, what comes out? If it's anything other than love, then that means you've added stuff. You've added stuff to you. Um, God plus ego equals man. Man minus ego equals God. Jesus was man minus ego. There's nothing in him that does not come from God. The only difference between him and us is in us, there's something else. Sin. And we're going to talk about what that, that is in, in just a moment. So, you're, so again, this, it's, just, it's a mirror reflecting back to you. There's the truth. Jesus is the truth in our mirror. It's the only, all, everything that you've ever seen your entire life, the only perfect truth that we've ever seen in our mirror in this world, the only perfect truth that's ever walked into our world, into our mirror, is Jesus. And that's grace. Because things don't just happen, as we talked about last week, things happen just. Everything is just. It's a perfect reflection. But, but grace showed up into our mirror. We don't deserve that. We don't deserve unconditional love because, because we reap what we sow. What we've been sowing is conditional love, so we have, to rece- we have to reap conditional love. Except for somehow grace managed to come into our mirror. And it's the only perfect love that's showed up in our entire, all of, ever since human beings have been walking on this earth, since the fall, it, we, there's never been a perfect reflection of, of the, there's never been perfect love and perfect truth except for him. He's the only one. And so when you look at him, the more you look at him and just focus on him, believe in the one whom the Father has sent, the more your mirror is perfect love. And then the more you're just only looking at that, the more you get perfected in love. And then the more you do that, the more you're going to be just like him. Less, less of me and more of you, God. And, you're, it, and you become, it's in your weakness that is his strength. Instead of you trying to do it on your own, you're not trying to do anything on your own. You're just looking at him and then he's using you to do whatever he wants to do with you. And it's none of your business what he even decides to do with you. It's literally none of your business. Your business is just to receive the love that God is and to be the, the, the extension, expression of love that you are. We are sun rays to the sun, but we don't experience that whenever we're turned away looking at the darkness. And so, your e- so again, in the reflection, your ego is Judas. And what did Judas show? Perfect love shows up and Judas turns in perfect love for a bag of gold. Silver. So, and that's what your ego, not even gold, damn. <laughs> Slivery little silver. Slipping it right, that's crazy, right? But that's your, so your ego is Judas. And it, every, it, it, it says, hey, there's, now there's love right here. You, you sit and Judas is hanging out with love all day. But there's got to be something more than love. What about this gold or this silver? Not even the gold, the silver. What about this silver? And it gives up love. Judas gives up love for a bag of silver. That's what you're doing all day, every day. When you turn away from Jesus. When you turn away from God, when you follow your flesh, when you're looking for what you want, for your preferences, your desires, instead of just, what does God want? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek when? Seek first. Go to God first. Go to God when? First. So your ego is Judas. It gives up, it gives up love over and over for something that it thinks is more valuable. Our ego is literally created out of the belief, the lie that I'm not loved. That's how it started. That's how it keeps perpetuating. You have to believe that you're not loved in order to keep going out to get these things that you think is going to fill the void. Because that void that you're experiencing, that void, the only thing that, that fills that void is God. And, uh, and, and God is love. So you're dying for love. Our first breath was love. Our second breath was air. But you've traded in. You're like, no, I want to keep my, my body alive. But your body is nothing. It's a mist. It's a vapor. Just dust it came and dust it shall return. It's just going to be here for a minute. Bodies die. 
it's going to die, that, but you're not. As long as you follow the one who didn't die, whose body died, his di- body died, but he's like, follow me. I'll show you the way. I am the way. Just follow me. You're going to have to let your body down because it's not you. But who you are still remains. As long as you can see who I am that still remains after who I'm not is gone. So that's why you have to believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Like Because otherwise, if you can't see, that's the part of your mirror that is eternal. If you can't see the resurrection of him, then you can't see the resurrection of you. You can't see what happens to you when this, this body that you're not dies because you've merged with it. So you're giving up love for something that you think is more valuable. You think your body's more valuable. You think, your, you think your beliefs are more valuable. You think your things are more valuable. And just like Judas, you're turning away from love. Love was right there, but just turning away for something that it perceives to be more valuable. The only way that it perceives there's be something more valuable is because there's still a void inside. There's still a consumer inside. There's still a liar in there telling you there's something more. There's something else. There's something different. There's something better. And so our ego is literally created out of the belief that I am not loved. If you knew that you were loved, all that stuff that you keep going out there trying to get, you know, whoring yourself out, you would never do that. Only someone who perceives themselves to not be loved would turn themselves into a whore. And maybe you're thinking, well, I'm not a whore. Have you ever traded your time for money? You're a whore. A slave. To a satanic kingdom. So, if you knew that you're not only loved, but our love itself, your ego would fall away easily and effortlessly And all that would be left would be love. That's it. Once you know, for sure, without a doubt, that you are infinitely loved, and you are love itself, the extension, expression of love in form, you are that. You are the sun way to the sun. That's you being sent out. Earth was created for, uh, as an extension of heaven. That's the whole purpose of earth is an extension of heaven. So heaven can keep expanding into time and space. And we were put here to be the conduit for that, for the, for heaven to come to earth. So, uh, earth, heaven gives earth meaning. Earth gives heaven expression. You give heaven expression. That's what you are. Love itself coming through you, but when you've cut yourself off from the vine because you're trying to get love, but the only reason you're trying to get love, you're going to get significance, going to get attention, get all these things that you think is going to fill the void, but it will not do it. You're leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. So everybody say, I'm done being kissed by Judas. I'm done being betrayed. I'm done betraying myself. I'm done betraying God. I'm ready to be kissed by love. And, and so you have soul needs and body wants. Your body wants things, but your body doesn't, re- it has like needs for like food and water and things to stay alive, but what good is it to gain the whole world but lose your soul? What you need is your soul needs. You don't, it doesn't matter if you lose your body. That's what William Wallace, he didn't, he didn't have a problem with that. He's like, I'm just not going to lose. I mean, it was a little off, but if, if, if you just use the metaphor, obviously, you know, going and killing a bunch of people and stuff, that's not the, you know, <laughs> that's a, but if, but if you just, but it's, it's pretty badass. You know? If you just look at that, he just would not betray himself. He, he stood for something, you know, so as you stand for love, that's what we all are is love. So as you stand for love, as you stand as love, and you do not leave that no matter what, so what about this body? So what about these things? Like literally, they, they kept trying to give William Wallace everything. I'll make you a king. I'll give you everything. I'll give you your own province, your own whatever that you want. It's like, I don't want any. I just, freedom. <laughs> and so for you, it's like somebody come, I'll give you this. I'll give you that. I don't want that. What do you want? What I already am, love. I just, want, I just want what I am, love. And I'm not going to let you seduce me into becoming something else. 
That's who I am. That's what I am. That's why I am. So, soul needs and body wants. We got uh, Colossians 2. One, I think we're going 1 through 22 here. So, it's, it's quite a long one here, but uh, what? Oh, y'all laugh because Cole laughed. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. We'll do it. We'll do it at the end. Bring it back around. So, Colossians, Colossians 2. I, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for these, those at Laodicea and for all those who have not met me personally. So, that's, that's us. This is, P, this is uh, Paul speaking. So, everybody who has not met him personally, that's who he's speaking to. Everybody say, that's me. Everybody say, he's speaking to me. He, everybody say, he wrote these words specifically for me. He called me out. <laughs> it's right there. So, uh, so my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. The f- full riches of complete understanding. So they, that's where the full riches are. It's not about anything in this world. It's complete understanding. That's the full riches. And that's what I, so they, they're encouraged in their heart and united in love. The great remembering, so they have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What's hidden in Christ? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not just part, but all of it. So you don't need anything other than him. That's it. You got him, you got every, you don't need to need, know about all these secret things and the secret tombs and the secret room, rooms and all this. Se- just Christ. Just believe in the one whom Father sent. Stop getting sucked all into those black holes ever there, those swirls. <laughs> <laughs> the rooms and the tombs and the wombs. I tell you, I tell you this. Oh, this is great. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to, to live your lives in him rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it. Here you go. This is the, I've seen so many people in the world. This, this got me because I was an evangelist atheist for 20 years. Paul already told me to, what was coming. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Oh, man, we have philosophers out the wazoo, atheists. That's where it is. It's all philosophy. It's just philosophy. It doesn't mean anything. It's just made up bullshit. So uh, it's hollow. It's in, in deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So if it's built on, based on anything other than Christ, it's hollow and it is deceptive. Stay away. I hope you're hearing. Amen. If not, you'll go get sucked in those black holes thinking you got something good, some great philosophy, but it's hollow and it's deceptive if it's not based on, built on Christ. Because all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the treasures are in him. You go outside of that, you're, you're asking for it. You're about to be betrayed by your own creation. So for in Christ... Okay, so all good things come from God. You start stepping outside of that, then you're going to get something other than good. You're making it up. That's your creation now. You can do what God says, or you can do what you want to do. If you do what you want to do, that's your creation. And your creation will betray you every single time. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's, who's found that out thus far? Yeah. So who's like, okay, I don't need to do that anymore. Okay, great, thank you. So for, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. How much of the fullness? All of it in Christ 
All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. What happens with you when you give yourself fully to Christ? What, what do you get? Fullness. Wholeness. Completeness. But what if you give half of you to Christ? You got halfness. You're now you're half-assed. <laughs> Incomplete. <laughs> your whole ass. The whole ass. We, you can either... You be a whole, the whole ass or asshole. You get you got to pick the whole ass or the asshole. Don't get sucked into that asshole. The whole ass. Go for the whole ass. Jesus Christ. Give your whole ass to Jesus Christ. Not just your asshole. <laughs> preach it. Thank you. <laughs> that'll preach. I don't, know, I don't know if that'll really preach or not. I mean, I guess it is kind of preaching a little bit right now, but. Not in the traditions, not in the religious tradition. That ain't going to work. That ain't going to float too well. <laughs> but it's the truth. All right. So, uh, so in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised. Check, it, check, check out, dudes. Are you all right? In him, you were circumcised. Not performed by human hands. Oh, oh, wait, hold on. What you mean? Hold on. What are you talking about then? What do you mean not performed? How you get, well, what's, oh, oh yeah, there's AI robots now. So that's what we're talking about. Lasers and stuff we're doing. No, that's not what he's talking about. So your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Your whole self, the whole thing ruled by the flesh that whole thing, if you, if you truly receive Christ, that whole self that is not you, it gets circumcised off of you. It's a flesh that gets cut off of you so your head can actually finally come out and breathe. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Your, whole f- your flesh is covering your head. Cut the flesh away. That's what he's talking about. That's what the circumcision is. It's not about your wiener. It's about your heart. It's about your soul. Your soul has been covered in flesh. Cut it off so your soul can breathe the love that it was created for. So your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that is now in you. When you've, received, when you've been circumcised of the flesh, you've laid it all down, your whole, your whole flesh self, it's a false self. It's not you. It's a lie. That's the one that was destined for death. That's the one that's condemned already. It's dying anyway. But you can, die by, you can let it die by choice. And if you'll let it by, die, by, die by choice instead of chance, then you actually chose to come home. Secret of life is to die before you die by choice. Those who love their life will surely lose it. But those who will give their lives for him, they're going to be with him for eternity. Where he came up, that same spirit that raised him up, you get that same spirit. It raises you up. So you're Flesh is being circumcised off of your soul, and then you get to raise up to eternal life even when this body dies. No biggie. No big deal. Uh, So you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. So we were legally indebted because God says, don't do that, don't do that, that, don't do any of these things. How many did at least one of those things? All, all the things, like, everybody here has done at least one of the things at least one time, and we've all done it a, a whole lot more than one of the things, a whole lot more than one of the times. So we were legally, according to the law, the law that this whole entire universe hangs on, the word of God is spoken to existence. So according to that law, we are legally in debt now. We owe, uh, like, we, we ha- like uh, it cost us our life. It costs us our soul. That's what it costs to sin. And we did it. And so we're legally indebted. But uh, he forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He didn't stand against us. He didn't condemn us. Our debt that we owe because we broke the law, that stood against us. That condemned us. And so... 
He took that away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. If you looked at William Wallace, when you watch the movie, he's laying there getting murdered. And they're like, just plead for mercy. And they're like, and after he, they're ripping him to shreds and he's like, just, ah, oh, in so much pain. He starts going, and then the guy's like, oh, oh, the, the, the prisoner, he wants to say something. And the guy's like so certain that, the, that, that he's going he's gonna to say mercy. And they're all shouting mercy. They're all saying mercy, mercy, the whole crowd. And he's laying there in so much pain. They're like, Mer-, they're, they're having so much pain. They're like, please, man, just say mercy so they'll kill you. And he's, they're like, okay, good. He's finally going to say it so we can actually be comfortable. Because even the guys like sitting there, oh, God, like, come on, man. We got to like, come on, please say mercy so I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable anymore. So, but he's the one going through it. And, the, and then he's like, and they're like, okay, okay, let's let him speak. Okay, he's going to say mercy. We, we have triumphed. We have got his ass. And he goes, <gasps> He didn't betray himself. He didn't get broken. Now, of course, they got that from Jesus, that whole thing. That's an extraordinary, incredible scene, but it's, a, it's an incredible, it's a, that's, ba- that's based on a true story. That's based on Jesus. Jesus did not betray himself. He did not betray God, and he did not betray us. So, uh, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Now, if you're living inside of the world, inside of delusions, it looks like he, he's the one that they made a spectacle. They triumphed over him. They, they triumphed over Jesus. They killed him. But no, it's the opposite. He triumphed over them. And he made a spectacle of them. We're all talking about a day like, like, what idiots. Like, we can look back. We see how big of idiots they are. And they were. They didn't know that. And the people that can't see that are idiots. The people that think Jesus died are idiots. They're the spectacle. Everybody who does it, like, these people were made a spectacle. And if you're looking at that mirror, because the whole world is your mirror, if you're looking at the ones that murdered Jesus and think that they actually murdered Jesus, they were a spectacle. You're a spectacle as well. So... Uh, he's triumphed over them. Therefore, do not any, let anyone judge you by what you eat or what you drink or with regard to a religious fest, festival, a new moon celebrating, celebration, or a Sabbath day. So don't get all religious, y'all. Don't let people judge you by what you're eating, what you're drinking. If you got regard to a religious festival or a new moon or celebration of the Sabbath day, these are all a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. It's not about the rituals, the religion. It's the relationship with Christ. It's, the reality is found in Christ. These are just shadows. These are just something that people are using to point to him. But it's not, it's not him Find what's, where it's coming from and where it's, where it's going. It's coming from him, going to him. Don't get stuck on the surface. If I'm pointing at something, stop looking at my finger and start looking at what I'm pointing at. All these festivals, all these r- rituals, they're just pointing at him. Don't get lost in the doing. You're a human being, but you don't know that when you're doing so much to finally try to get somewhere. But every time you're trying to get somewhere, you're leaving where you actually already are, which is home with him if you will let him, in, in your, in home, let him have home in your heart. So uh, these, are the sh- these are shadow of the things that were to come. And the reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. So many people, this false humility, acting like they're all humble, but it's just, they're just acting like it. It's, it's still a doing. They're doing humility. They're not actually humble. They're doing humility. They're doing these things. They're doing uh, authenticity. They're doing uh, what... What looks like the right thing, but it's, it's a doing of it. It's not a being it. So, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person 
also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They get all, you know, the, you know, the people these days, some of the new agey stuff is the conscious language. And they get so spiritual in their conscious language. And they say everything so conscious and so perfect. And that's what's making them look. And then they look at me and they're like, that dude's not spiritual. Look at his language. Look how unconscious he is. I did all the conscious language stupid shit. And it didn't get me anywhere. It got me further and further away from the truth. Because it was all just for looks. And your looks don't get you nothing. You're, if anything, it gets you further away from God. If you're looking at your looks, you're getting further away from God. You're looking at your looks at getting further away from God. I'm like, I remember when I was 25 years old, I started going bald. I'm like, no, my life is ruined. And I thought it was like, how could this be? I was looking at my looks, which means I was far away from God. And now I'm like, thank God. Because that was, that was actually the beginning of my awakening. Literally, this... I, this uh, yeah, yeah, I was like, no. It literally, that, that's, that was the beginning of my awakening because now I'm like, oh, I can't look at my looks anymore. <laughs> what else do I got? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So thank God I, I started going bald. I'd probably still be atheist if I didn't go start going bald. I'm serious, y'all. So I pray to any of y'all looking at your looks. I pray you get fat, bald, and get some big old warts all over your face, or you can, or you can give it up first. <laughs> Praise God. If you get, it's okay to have it. Don't let it have you. It's okay to have your conscious language, but I pray if your conscious language has you, I pray that somehow you, something stupid starts coming out of your mouth. Something, I don't know. Uh, somehow you start looking really, really stupid because that's going to be the greatest gift. So you, once you're like no longer in control of you looking stupid, then you're, then you're just going to let yourself look stupid. I mean, you don't have a choice. You're just stuck stupid. My YouTube channel? Yeah, the, I have my YouTube channel, I had these Indian guys that were making shorts for me, these little 30 second to 60 second long th- shorts. And uh, they, they did a really great, because... First of all, the things that I'm saying, most, most people, like anybody who's uh, looking at their looks and they think it's all about the package, what it looks like, they have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. No clue. So to try to piece together what I'm saying, even if they spoke English very well, it'd be very difficult. But these people speak Indian or whatever this language is. Is it Indian? Is that the language? Am I, I don't even know what, the lang- what that is. Hindi. So, when they pieced it together, uh, I, I, they, they'd, and they'd blast it out, and they got a lot of views. They're, so, they were, they were getting a whole lot more views. By the way, I'm doing it now, and I don't get very, I'm, doing, I'm, running, my own, well, I, I'm running my own thing now, uh, and I don't get very many views anymore. <laughs> These guys got plenty of views, but all I was getting in the comments were just how big of an idiot I sounded like. And, and I was, actually did it on purpose. I, I, I paid the guys for several months to keep doing it because I could see that I had a resistance to it. I'm like, you know, there's, and I remember, you know, when Joe Biden started coming around and I'm like, Joe Biden, look at that idiot. He can't even speak, man. Look at him. And there is literally one of these shorts where it was, I, I, I sounded even worse than Joe Biden. I was like, eh, 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 uh, you know, you know uh, yeah, uh, and then, well, let me tell you about, and so, you know, yeah, and it's like, that was the whole short, and then somebody commented and say, you sound like Joe Biden, I'm like, they're not wrong, they're not wrong, I'm like, okay, okay, so there goes, there went my judgment, you know, so I was great to get my judgment out of the way, so, uh, yeah, what a great gift, I'm telling y'all, Greatest gift you can give yourself, go out there and just look stupid by choice instead of by chance. Because you look stupid anyway, just letting y'all know. Every one of y'all looks stupid as shit. You just, especially, it's funny, as, as Mel, every, every, every now and again she'll have a new like awakening, like she'll get to like a next level of awakening, and she pops into it and all, and it's like a veil gets removed and she can see so clearly and she's like, wow, this is amazing. And then she's, all of a sudden something hits her. She's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> 
you could you could see like this this whole time because it's like it's like because because she got she got X-ray vision all of a sudden because the veil gets removed because now she can see her through through her illusion so she can th- see through everybody else's. She's like, look at these people. Oh my God, they can't even see what they're doing. Oh my God, this is crazy. And then all of a sudden it hit her. She's like, wait a minute. You, you, I'm a people, and you could you could you see like this this whole time? I'm like, yes, I could. And she's like. And she all of a sudden, she's all embarrassed because she knew that I could see all of her bullshit that whole time. And I was telling her about it, but she couldn't even hear what I was saying. And now she makes it through. The others. Oh. So uh, just to let you know, the ones who are looking at their looks, y'all look the stupidest of anybody. And y'all just don't even know how stupid you look. You think you look cool, but you actually, you don't, you don't it's not even that you look stupid, you actually are stupid. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're so stupid. And you'll see it one day. You're like, damn, I was so stupid. Holy, it's not I looked, I looked worse than stupid. I like, I was, am stupid. I was, so. All right, so. Uh, so yeah, these are shadow things. Uh, so do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they've seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews. So I don't even know what that word means. I don't even know what sinews. I don't even know what that is, but I don't care because I know what it's talking about. I'm not worried about the word. It's what the word is pointing at. I don't know what a sinew is. And I'm not worried that y'all don't, and I'm not worried that y'all are looking at me like, damn, he's supposed to be up there teaching and he doesn't even know what it, the heck he, the words even he's reading about are. I, I don't know what the words are, but I know what it's pointing at. I know where it's coming from and I know where it's going. And that's what matters. Words don't mean shit. They're just packages. Open up the package, y'all. Open up. Everybody say, open the package. <laughs> Sinews hold everything together. So... Uh, so sinews hold ever to get everything together in the flesh. And that's why I'm not, hold, see, that's why that's pr- perfect. Why I didn't know that word, because I'm not worried about what's holding the flesh together. I'm looking at what's holding the spirit together. Amen. So, um, where are we at? Sinew, sinew, uh, holds us all together, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? You're supposed to be dead in Christ already. Why is it that you're still submitting to the rules of the world? Why are you still bowing, bowing to the beast? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch these rules which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What the point of it all is to restrain your sensual indulgence, to get you to stop following your flesh. This is actually doing the opposite. You're following your flesh by looking like you're not. You're, you're trying to make it look like you're not following your flesh, which is actually following your flesh because you're just still worried about your flesh. You're still worried about what it looks like instead of actually what it is. It's all about circumcision from the flesh. Letting it all fall off. What this world wants, what it's got for you, what you want from it, let all that stuff go because it's all about God. Grace does not free you to sin. It doesn't free you so that you can sin. So grace does not free you to sin. It frees you from your sin. Grace does, because, well, I can just be forgiven for anything, anytime. Yes. Well, cool, then I can just do whatever I want, whatever I want. No. Because if you receive grace, you won't want to do that bullshit anymore. Like, that's how you know you haven't received it. Because when you receive grace, it's this unmerited unconditional love of God. And the only reason you were sinning in the first place is because you didn't think that you were loved. If you received grace, then now you know that you're loved and now you won't be sinning anymore. You won't be doing the stupid thing that you were doing, trying to feel valuable, trying to feel appreciated, trying to feel significant, trying to feel heard, trying to feel seen. Whatever all those things that you were doing in your flesh for your flesh, you don't do those anymore. So grace does not free you to sin so that you can keep sinning. It frees you from your sin because now you no longer have the need for it. You no longer have the desire for it. It because you finally are the one who is loved. 
The one who is loved doesn't do those stupid things. The one who, the one who is loved is not a whore. Whores are people that don't know that they are loved and that they are loved, and so they are going out there giving to get, trying to get something that they actually already are and already have, leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. So, so, what's, so, so again, grace does not free you to sin. It frees you from your sin. What is your sin? Your sin is your perceived separation from God. Everyone say perceived separation from God. And we're saying perceived because there's no spot that God is not. You can't actually be separate from God. You can only perceive yourself to be that way because you've got a lie in your eye. So your, so your sin is your perceived separation from God and then the actions that come from that. Sin is not the action to be punished. It's the perception to be, the, be corrected. The perception is the source of the action. The action is the symptom. The perception is the cause. If you're trying to treat the symptoms, if you're trying to fix people's actions, you're missing the whole point. That's just treating a symptom. It didn't, the, the problem is their perception, their perceived separation from God, their perceived separation from love. So, um, so what is your sin? Your perceived separation from God and the actions that come from that. To make it more tangible, 1 John 4, 8 says, those who don't know love don't know God, for God is love. Everyone say, God is love. God is love. They would say, if I don't know love, I don't know God. For God is love. So what is sin? Sin is a perceived separation from love. That's what sin is. Sin is a perceived separation from love. Not a true separation from love, because you can't possibly separate from love, because love is all there is. But you can perceive yourself to be what you believe to be true is true for you. Even if it's bullshit, you can make something not real more real than real. So sin, it's a perceived separation from what? love. What's love? Infinite connection. There's no spot that love is not. So we leave what is real in the pursuit of what appears to be. We're leaving the truth for a lie. That appears to be love over there. No, you're already sitting in love. You're already in love. When Ab and Eve were chilling in the garden, they had everything. And they said, there's got to be something more than everything. The only thing that more than everything is nothing. They gave up everything for nothing. Leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. Giving up God in the pursuit of God. If you'll eat this fruit, then you're going to be like God. They already were. They already were. God made them in his likeness and image. They already were. They listened to a lie and bit it hook, line, and sinker. And then poof, fell into an illusion. So... Um, there is no equivalent to God's favor because people don't love you like that. So when God loves you, you push it away. Uh, Stephen Furtick said, favor feels funny. I always say we do the wrong thing so long, the right thing feels wrong. So there's no equivalent for God's favor. It feels funny when God's favor comes in because you're not used to that. You're used to dealing with people. You're used to trying to give and get with people. But God is not a give to getter. God is an unconditional giver, an unconditional lover. That's not the way people are because people are whores. Why? Because they don't know they're loved and they're trying to get love. Leaving what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. Leaving God, leaving love in the pursuit of what appears to be love. Ooh, this person will love me. And then if they say this to me, then I'm going to finally feel loved. They said the thing, how'd you feel? It felt good. For how long? A few minutes. And, and then what happened? Then I begged him to say it again. And then what did he do? He, he said it again. Okay, and then you were filled forever? No. What happened? I, I needed him to go buy me something. I needed Okay, did he go buy? Yeah, he bought me something. Did that do it? Yeah. For how long? A few moments. And then what, and then what happened? Then I needed him to do something else. <laughs> it just keep going. It's never going to happen. It's never going to fill you. People can't do it. People are not enough for you because they weren't created to be. You're not enough for people because you weren't created to be. I would try ever say that. I'm not enough for people. Because I wasn't created to be. Ah, man, come on. Let, just, everybody just breathe that. Ah, come on. That's crazy trying to be enough for people. Who here has ever tried to be enough for people before? Yeah. It's not going to work. You're never going to be enough. As you notice, they're never enough for you. Yes, and you're never going to be enough for them because that's not the way that it works. So, 
There's no equivalent for God's favor because people don't love, like, love you like God does. So when God loves you, what do you do? You push it away because you do the wrong thing so long, the right thing feels wrong. You're so used to rejection when you, you, that you'll find it when it's not even there. You hear that? You're so used to rejection that you'll find it when it's not even there. Anybody ever seen somebody do that before? Anybody seen somebody find rejection when it wasn't even actually present? Anybody ever seen yourself do that before? You've probably done it a whole lot more than you think. So you're so used to rejection that you find it when it's not even there. You can have love and acceptance standing right in front of you and not even see it. Hey, buddy, can you put, can you put that away? That's, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Love you. Yeah, go give it to David. Go give it back there to King David. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can, have, you can have love and acceptance standing right in front of you and not even see it. Anybody ever seen somebody have love and acceptance standing right in front of them and not see it? Yeah. Yeah, that's you. Start owning that stuff. Um, People with sins on their lens block their blessings because they don't like or recognize the package. Package. So do the wrong thing so long, the right thing feels wrong. We get so used to packages. I remember uh, my uh, uh, publish, publisher for my book, he says, uh, like, his whole job is to make you look good. And he's like, I, you know, you, you got to handle what's in there. But he's like, he, taught, he uses the metaphor of the... Uh, what kind of box? A Tiffany box. And he's like, if I were to come to you and I give you a, I give you a, a Tiffany box or a brown paper bag, how many people do you think are going to pick the Tiffany box? Pretty much everybody's going to pick the Tiffany box because, well, it's a brown paper bag. There's probably nothing valuable in there. But a Tiffany box, there's something valuable in there. People literally buy the Tiffany boxes just to put stuff in it. They're literally just a box. People buy the boxes because they think the box is valuable. And so he's like, my job is, to put, is you put you in the Tiffany box. I don't care what's in there. I just got to put you in the box. And that's never been my, my thing. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just working on, I'm going to make sure I'm a diamond. And if anybody opens this thing, what they're going to find is a diamond. That's all I'm working on. I don't care. I don't care if you open this thing or not. But if you do, if you actually look what's going on in here, it's a diamond. And so that's, that's, what I'm, that's all I pay attention to. Um, so people with sins in their lens, they block their blessings because they don't even, they, they don't like, the, like or recognize the package. They don't, they don't, the blessing is coming, the favor is coming, but they don't like the package because they're so used to looking at, the, looking at what looks good versus what is good. What looks good and what, I, what is good are oftentimes not the same. Oftentimes the exact opposite of each other. So they choose suffering. <laughs> Souls handing out treats. Chips. chips. What is it? Chips. Oh, a chip. Okay. You want to take communion, buddy? Okay. Thank you. Do you want it? Do you want me to have it? I can have it. All right, everybody. Good. Can you pass out and we'll give everybody a chip? Uh, he's, can you give everyone one? Is there more? Okay. We're going to do a communion with a, uh, yeah. Can you give everyone, can you give everyone so, I don't know, for some reason, Sol decided he wanted to hand out uh, tortilla chips, little pieces. So, I guess we're going to do communion here in just a moment when we all get one. Y'all can have a chip or whatever y'all want to do up there on, online. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, perfect. We're talking about the package. People choose suffering. People block their blessings because they don't like recognize the package. Oh, you're going to give me a whole one? I don't need a whole Yeah, you got to break it off and give it a little bit to everybody. Look, I'm literally, I'm sitting here talking about people block their blessings. You see love and acceptance standing right in front of you and you don't even see it. It's standing right in front of you and don't even see it because you don't recognize the package. Like, there's no way that's the favor of God. But this little, this little beautiful little boy is walking around just giving gifts to people. He, th- he thinks it's a gift. So, because he, this little innocent little child is walking around handing people little chips of chips. And he, he's handing it because he thinks it's a gift, which means it is a gift because it's coming from love. And so we're receiving it. We're receiving that gift. 
I mean, it literally, he did this right when I said, people with sins in their limbs block their blessings because they don't recognize the package. And they choose suffering because they do recognize and like that package. They, they, which is the stuff out there, the world. But it's not about the package. It's about what's in it. It's not about this chip. It's about what's in it. It's the love that's in this chip that he just, like that was God just did that whole thing right there. God put love in this, in this, in this chip of a chip. God put love in it and delivered it to us through that little boy. Just pure love. And now this represents, as we said, communion. The body of Christ. Oh, look, he's still handing it. Yeah, he's making sure everybody gets one. We'll, 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 hold, we'll save this for the, for the end there. Uh, so people choose suffering because they recognize and they like the package of suffering. The, the package that suffering comes in, like, ooh, I like that package. They don't even care what's in it, but they like the package. What's in it is suffering. I don't care. It looks good. So you always find what you're looking with. You thought I was going to say for. Yeah. You always find what you're looking for, but what you're looking for is what you're looking with. Where you're coming from is where you're going. So you always find what you're looking for. Why? Because you always find what you're looking with. What are you looking with? If you're looking with judgment, you're going to find judgment. If you're looking with love, you're going to find love. Even if it's a chip of a chip. Especially if it's a chip of a chip. When you're looking with love, you're going to find love. You don't find what you're looking for. You, don't, you, you always find what you're looking for. But what you're looking for is what you're looking with. Most people think, well, I'm looking for love. You're not looking for love because you're looking with lack of love. You're looking with judgment for love. If you're looking for love, see, we're not here to, don't do things for love, do things from love. If you're looking for love, it means that you are looking from lack of love, which means you're looking with judgment. You're looking with disconnection. You're looking with fear. You're looking with lies. And so that's all you're going to be able to see. You're not going to get anything. Everything you want and don't have is on the other side of letting go of something you are dead certain about. We live in an upside down, backwards world. The ego is perfectly logical, yet clearly insane. It all, it's logical to the ego. Yeah, well, no, this, this is what I should do. This is what I should do. It makes lot, perfect sense to the ego. It's logical, but it's insane. What's insanity doing? The same thing over and over, expecting a different result. How many times have you tried that thing that you're just doing right there? How many times have you tried to get love from a person? How many times have you tried to, you know, get filled with whatever these things that your, your pleasures and your things, and how many times does it end you, it leave you with a bigger hole than you had before you started? Every single time, because it's, this world will never fill you. Uh, so life is a paradox to our egoic minds because its world is the opposite of truth. The more we get out of our head of what we think we want and open our hearts to what God knows our soul needs, the more we receive the kingdom of God and experience heaven on earth. Wanting something and never getting it is how we create a low-level suffering. Anybody ever wanted something for a real long time and just, it just stayed right out of your reach for a real long time? Okay, that, so that's that's your creation that you created to perpetuate a low level of suffering. You're, be, you're being betrayed by your own creation. You're keeping it just out of your reach. But what's even worse than that, when you really want to suffer, here's how you do it. You get what you want, and then you lose it. And that's how you create high level suffering. So wanting something and never getting it, that's how you create your low level suffering. But when you really want to suffer, you get what you want, what your ego wants, and then you lose it. And then you really, oh, my heart is shattered. My heart is broken. I lost the thing. Now I'm never going to be able to love again. And I'm never going to be loved again. You're betrayed by your own creation because that thing was the condition that you put on love. Love is unconditional. If you've got a condition upon it, it ain't love. It's an anti-love. You've packaged love. You put love in, your own, in a package that you liked, that you wanted. And when you put it in that package, you blocked out everywhere else it is, which is everywhere else. It's in there too, but you can't receive it anywhere else because you put the condition on this package because you like this package and not that one. Uh, 
You believe what you want for you is better for you than what God wants for you. That's your problem. You believe what you want for you is better for you than what God wants for you. And you're like, no, I, I know me and I know what I want. I know. And you're even afraid to even say, you know what? Uh, I want what God wants for me. I mean, people, you'll say it probably now, being all spiritual and everything, but if you're being real with yourself, like it's terrifying to say, I want what God wants for me more than I want what I want for me. Because what if God says, okay, cool. Uh, uh, thank you. Well, it's time for you to go hang up here in this cross while people, all your friends betray you and spit on you and uh, jab you in the side and let the blood pour out. Well, whoa, 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 hold on now. Uh, can, can we uh, negotiate? <laughs> But if God tells you to go hang on a cross, all your friends betray you and go hang on a cross and get your blood po poured out, it's because that's better for you than what you wanted. And when you get that, then that what God wants for you, no matter what it looks like, what God wants for you is better for you than what you want for you because you can't see the picture when you're inside of it. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things work for good, for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. What works for good? All things. As long as you love God and you're called according to his purpose, everything that you got, it's for, it's for good It's because it's for God. And it's, it's, cracking, it's cracking the shell open. It's circ circumcising your flesh. It's getting your flesh falling apart so that your soul can actually get a breath of air, get a breath of love, get a breath of God. So we don't manifest what we want. We manifest what we are. Wanting is your ego's way of escaping the love that you are and already have. I'll say it again. Here, let's all say that together. Well, I'll say it and then you repeat. Wanting is my ego's way of escaping the love that I am and already have. So once you start doing that, you're wanting... Is I'm wanting this. That's your ego's way of escaping the love that you already are and have. I want this. And when you do that, you leave what's real in the pursuit of what appears to be. It's Judas betraying you, telling you, hey, th this is better than, than love. This bag of silver is better than love. We stop manifesting love when we believe who we are is not loved. And we start manifesting the illusory lack of love. There is no such thing as lack of love, but we can start to manifest, make obvious what is actually not there, but we can start to see it. We manifest the illusory lack of love when we perceive ourselves to be someone who is not loved. So who's done doing that? Say, I am. All right, everybody say, I, I believe that what God wants for me is better than what I want for me. I'm done being kissed by Judas. I'm done being betrayed. I'm done betraying God. I'm ready to be kissed by love. All right, so um, only wanting what God wants for us and realizing that whatever is happening is what God is allowing to happen to assist us in letting go of what we want that isn't good for us and receiving what he knows will fulfill us is how we experience heaven. Jesus said, uh, you want to find your way back home? Well, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Follow me. I'll go first. I'm not going to just tell you. I'm going to show you. So, who here wants to find your way back home to, to love, to re receive God, receive love? Okay. Well, Jesus said, okay, follow me. Just follow me. I'm the way. I'm the truth of the life. And I'll go first. I'm not, I, just, I came here so I could walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. Instead of it's just words, you can talk with God without Jesus, but you can't walk with God unless you got Jesus. Because Jesus literally came to walk on this earth to walk, so God could walk with us to walk us home. Because he was able to extend because he's 100% man. He could touch us. And because he's 100% God and perfect and holy, he can touch God. So he, he's a bridge. We, he came because the distance between man and God was too great. He, he's a bridge. He closed that gap. 100% man and 100% God. He's 100% man because he, he, he becomes 100% man so he can touch us. 
and so that he can pay the debt that man owes. So he paid it. We owe a debt, so he paid it. He touches us and, then, and touches God and connects us and then dissolves. He gives himself over so that we, we can reconnect. So he pays the debt. He comes man because man has to pay the debt. So in order for the debt to be paid, man had to pay it, which means he had to become man in order to pay it. And so he became man, paid the debt, one hand on us and one hand on God. And then when we receive that payment, he dissolves and we meet God. So uh, I'm the way. Follow me. I'll go first. So Jesus says, uh, so it's Jesus says I'm going to go first. So watch this. All right, God, uh, what will you have me do? God says, get betrayed by a kiss, die on a cross. And Jesus says, um, I want to do it a different way. Is there any other way? He asked three times. So he's showing, we, he, he's like, dude, uh, I can relate to you. I get it. Like, I, I'm 100% man, and I do not want to get just completely slaughtered. I don't want to get betrayed and slaughtered. So I get it. I get that you don't want, there are certain things that you don't want. I get it. I didn't want this either. I, I pleaded three times. I s- fell to my knees and begged and sweat blood three times to ask for a different way. So I understand that you're asking for a different way. I get it. But there is no other way. That's what the father said. This is the only way. And Jesus said, okay, well, if this is the only way, not my will, but thine be done. Even though it does not look like the best way in my limited perspective, because he's, he's like, I know because he's inside the picture right now. He's in a body. And he's like, it doesn't, from my perspective, it looks like there's got to be a better way. But I know that I have a limited perspective. And so I know that your way is higher than mine because he says, um, I and my father are one, except that he is greater because he's got the higher perspective when I'm walking in a body right now. Because uh, he, he, he had to give up his, his higher perspective in order to be, a hum, to be a man, to be a human. He had to walk as a human. And so he, he laid down that, the, the, the supernatural sight in order to be able to walk as a human. And so, uh, like, he, again, he said, yeah, I, I don't even know when the end comes. As he's walking in time, like, I don't even know. I'm hanging out in time with y'all. I don't even know. I'm connected with the Father, but the Father didn't tell me. So if the Father doesn't tell me, then I don't know. But here's what the Father told me. He says, I got to go to the cross and die. And so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, he says, I trust you, Father, wholly, completely, and unconditionally. He didn't put any conditions on it. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, I'll, I'll do it, God, if you'll do this. There was none of that. It was, he wholeheartedly, fully, completely and unconditionally gave everything. Not my will, but thine be done. Second Corinthians, we'll, um, it's our last Bible verse, and then we'll, uh, we're getting really close here. So Second Corinthians 5, awaiting the new body. For we know that if the earthly tent that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because we are, when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or are away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, 
so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, some may say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all. That those who live shall no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly viewpoint of view, or a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So it's not, don't look at the package. Don't look at the form. Don't look at the tent, these bodies. Look what's in there. Stop regarding people as human doings. And start regarding people as children of God. He says, that's how we see everyone. So from now on, we regard no one as a, from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in that way. And he's saying like the disciples, they, they, they even saw Jesus that way. And they're like, Peter's like, I don't want you to go die on the cross. Because he was looking at Jesus from a worldly point of view. He's like, we once regarded Christ that way, but we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. You are a new creation, entirely new creation. You were born first of the flesh, but that's not who you are. That's who you're not. When you're born again, you're born of the Spirit, who you truly are, always have been. The old has gone. So when you receive him, you're born again. The old is gone. You've now been circumcised. The flesh have been circumcised. You're no longer following fleshly, worldly things. You're following spiritual things. You're following Christ. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So now we've received him and he's committed us. Now what we're here to do, the ministry of reconciliation, of remembering, to help the rest of the brothers and sisters to remember. How do we remember? By remembering him, who he is for us. He is unconditional love. He is grace. So that's now our message, the message message of reconciliation. Everyone can come home now. There's a doorway. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's who we are now. God is now using us to make his appeal. Hey, children, you can come home. There is a doorway. Reconciliation is possible. You don't have to be lost without love any longer. You can come home. And we are now the ambassadors ambassadors of that message. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what we do, we create this illusory gap between us and others. But there are no others. It's a reconciliation. Love is infinite connection. We're here to remember the infinite connection. There is no spot that love is not. And so there's love inside of everyone. And it's not your job to extract it. It's your job to see it. It's God in everyone. It's not your job to extract it. It's your job to see it. And by seeing it, It starts to get extracted. It starts to come out. And you just don't let it go. No matter how much they got lies in their eyes, fears in their ears, judgments in their heart. No matter how hard they try to sell that to you, don't buy it. Don't buy the bullshit. Don't buy that they're not worthy of love. Don't buy that they're not worth it because they are. How do you know? Because we are. How do you know? Because he hung on a cross. Not because we're worthy, but because because we're worth it. We are worth it. So we create this illusory gap between us and others, but it's an illusory gap. Jesus has already filled the gap. What's actually in that gap is your true self. That distance between you and them, there's an illusory gap. It's not a real gap. It's actually your true self is in that gap. But what you've done is disconnected from your true self. You didn't disconnect from them. You disconnected from your true self. But rather than expanding into who we actually are, we keep a distance illusory distance. And we create a small illusory self. There's our true self. So when you infinitely expand into your true self, you're infinitely connected with the rest. But so the gap that you think is there, illusory gap, 
the gap is between your little mini me, illusory self, the little small self that you've created to protect yourself. And then your true self is what's in the gap. But you're keeping yourself small. The only thing you're in control of is your smallness, your suffering. And you're over suffering in silence, but you made the whole thing up. And so rather than just letting go and letting God and expanding, see, if you let go and let God and expand, you're going to be touching the others. You're going to be one with the others. But you're still trying to hold your little safety mechanism. You're still trying to hide in your little cage to protect yourself. But the only thing in between you and them is your true self. But you create an illusory gap by creating an illusory little small self, and then you fill that gap with lies, fears, and judgments. So as you undo this, so first, salvation is a point, freedom is a process. Salvation is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then receiving this Holy Spirit to start to cleanse your lens, to fill that gap with the, with the Holy Spirit. Is that Holy Spirit, because your little spirit that you've been trying to work with is so tiny, you're so tiny, but when you receive him, it's overflowing and you get filled up and f- overflowing and that whole gap gets filled and you get expanded out into your entire true self. But as you do that, you're, the, how you do that is you take the lies out of your eyes, the fears out of your ears, the judgments out of your heart. And so as you're operating in this illusion of separation, there's the freedom aspect. So salvation point freedom is a process. So now it's time for you to take responsibility for the lies that you've been perpetuating. And so when you're looking at reality, when you're looking at the space between you and the others, there's, there's, there's a few steps in this where you're responsible for. There's one is the facts. You're not responsible for the facts. There, whatever actually happened in reality, that's what happened. Now, you're responsible for looking at the facts as they are, but it doesn't even really matter what the facts are because the facts are just in reality. They're not in the truth. The truth is... There's no spot that God is not. That's the truth. The facts are what you use to keep yourself from that truth. So there's facts in reality. It's important to face the facts in reality. That's, okay, that's great. But to face them in reality, not inside of your delusion. But then even after the facts, then there's second, what you make the facts mean. And then there's third, what you make that mean about yourself. And then there's fourth, what you do about what you've made all that mean. And so... The most irrelevant part of it all is the facts. Facts are completely irrelevant relative to what you make the facts mean and what you make that mean about yourself and what you're going to do about that. So we're masters of every moment is inherently meaningless. We assign the meaning to the moment and whatever meaning you assign is going to determine your experience. And so if you make any fact, I don't care what the fact is, like so Jesus gets slaughtered on a cross his best friends turn, again, turn against him. He gets slaughtered on a cross. That's a fact. That's a historical fact. But the question is, what do you make that mean? The people that are living in sin make that mean, aha, he died and he's not God. He's not the Messiah. It was a fact, but they made it mean something that doesn't actually mean. They made it mean something other than what God meant it to mean. And that's why they're disconnected from God because of the meaning that they made. Your meanings are what's making the mess that's keeping you distanced from God. It's just the meanings inside of your own mind are what's keeping you at a perceptual distance from God. The meanings that you're making about the moment and then you're making about yourself because of the moment. So if you make any fact mean anything other than God is on the throne... then you're heading for hell. Everybody say that. If I make any fact mean anything other than God is on the throne, then I'm heading for hell. Can you all see that? Do you see it? The fact is meaningless. What you make the fact mean is what matters and is mattering. And if you make it mean anything other than God is on the throne, why? Why, if you make it mean anything other than God is on the throne, are you headed for hell? Because God is on the throne. And if it, it, and you're thinking, if you make it mean anything other than that, oh, no, everything's going wrong, everything's bad, oh, no, then you're now living in a delusion. You're living inside of a lie because God is on the throne. So if you make any fact mean anything other than God is on the throne, you're living inside of a lie. 
And if you're living inside of a lie, you're disconnected from the truth in your own experience. Not in truth. In truth, you can't disconnect from the truth, but in your experience that you can, in your perspective, perceive separation from God. So if you make the fact mean anything other than God is on the throne, and then you make that mean anything about you other than uh, I'm a child of God who is loved and chosen, you're headed for hell. So what are the facts? Doesn't even freaking matter. Let me say it doesn't matter what the facts are. The only thing that matters is God is on the throne. The only thing that matters for me is that I know that. And if I know that, then heaven is mattering for me. And, and so if you know that and heaven is mattering for you, then what you'll also know, oh, God is on the throne. And what this actually means about me is I'm a child of God who is infinitely loved, infinitely accept, I'm, I'm accepted, I'm chosen. I'm chosen by God. I'm worth it. And then when you've got that meaning about you, the sin is healed. Your ego was birthed out of I'm not worthy of love. I'm, I'm not loved. It's not I'm not worthy. I'm just not loved. It's not even I'm not, it's just that I'm not loved. That's a lie. That's never happened. Any, not ever, not once in history has there ever been anyone who is not loved. Never. But every single one of us bit that lie and operated from a lie that we're not loved and tried to fix what was never broken in the first place. So, again, if you make any fact mean anything other than God is on the throne and you make that mean anything about you other than I'm a child of God who is loved and chosen, then you're headed for hell. So my question to you, what has to happen before you make it mean, make every fact mean that you are loved and you are enough? What has to happen before you finally make every single fact mean that God is on the throne and that you are loved? What has to happen? That's a question. How about this? How about I give you something? How about the fact the fact, the historical fact that Jesus came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, he chose to die on a cross so that you don't have to. He's perfect. Perfect love. Is that a fact good enough for you to finally realize that you're good enough? That you're loved? God gave himself to you when he didn't have to. He could have just let you go to hell. But he gave you a way. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to give you a way home. You screwed up. He didn't. He's perfect. But he made a way home for you because you're worth it. Everybody say, I'm worth it. So, what was the phrase that I said earlier? Yeah, yeah. So, the only thing that's ever being betrayed is what you're not. And what you're not is only being betrayed by what you're not. Yeah. What you're not is being betrayed by what you're not. What it's not. We don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. But as we're seeing anything other than love, we're not seeing the world as we are. We're seeing the world as we're not. And we're seeing it as it's not. It's time to pull the lies out of our eyes. It's time to remember all the ego was birthed out of believing that I'm not loved. And that's a lie from Satan. So, as we start, it will end how we begin. Who here has ever experienced being betrayed by someone that you love? Who here would love to be loved without any fear of ever being hurt? Who here sees how that's actually possible now? How it's actually impossible to be betrayed? That was the lie that was in your eye. That was the fear that was in your ear, the judgment that was in your heart. You didn't see the world. You didn't see reality. You saw an illusion because you were living as an illusion. Someone who's not loved. There has never been a person who's ever existed who is not loved. Oh yeah, so let's take our, let's take our uh, communion here. Whenever you, well, let's do, a, let's, let's, uh, do a prayer and then we, you can uh, Take your communion whenever you are, as we go through the prayer, whenever you're feeling it. So everybody say, I believe that God wants, I believe that what God wants for me is better for me than what I want for me. I'm done being kissed by Judas. 
I'm done being betrayed. I'm done betraying myself. I'm done betraying God. I'm done betraying love. I'm ready to be kissed by love. I'm ready to be received by love. I'm ready to be accepted by love. I'm ready to be chosen by love. I'm ready to choose love. Take a deep breath in. Let it all go. As we pray, open your minds, open your hearts, and start to receive the love that God is and has for you. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for loving us so much. First, to let us go. But second, to send your son to give us a way home. The love that never changes, the love that would never betray itself, it stood as the truth. No matter how many lies the world tried to place upon you, you're a bad dad. You don't love us. You betrayed us. You stood in the truth. You came through all of our lies, all of our fears, all our judgments. Humanity tried to sell the lie that love doesn't exist. We tried to sell it so hard that when love showed up as perfect love in form, we tried to slaughter it thinking we can get rid of it. But you resurrected. You returned as grace in this place to take our place. Thank you for that. No matter how hard I fought, no matter how bad I tried to prove that love isn't real, that I'm not loved. You never stopped loving me. You never bought the lie that I was selling. I sold it to so many others that were living inside of the lie that they're not enough, but I couldn't sell it to you. So many others sold it to me But now it's over. No more lies. I'm buying the truth now. What's it cost me? My life. I'm laying it down. Because this life that I've been living is worthless anyway. I'm done with this world. I'm ready for heaven. And now I'm an ambassador of Christ. I open up my heart. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, the King of Kings. And I, I receive the crown that you put upon my head that you have been holding for me this whole time as I've been perceiving myself as a worthless orphan, slave, poor, giving to get. You've been holding my crown for me because you knew who I truly was the whole time. So I received this crown and now I'm an ambassador for you. Show the world this message of reconciliation, that there's a way home. You don't have to be lost without love anymore. You can come home. That we are now all fishers of men, as we've been caught and cleaned. Now we pay it forward. This unconditional love, and grace that God gave us, we let come through us into this world around us. And every time someone tries to sell us the lie that they're not loved by betraying us, we don't buy it. They are loved. That betrayal is just an illusion. The only thing that can get betrayed is what we're not, and, what, and the only thing that can betray is what we're not. We let what we're not go, and we let who we are in, because now we know whose we are. And we will never forget again, because love is not forgetting, it's forgiving. We have been forgiven, and now we are forgiving. Our whole life is forgiving, forgiving the love of God and the grace of God to the rest of our brothers and sisters who are lost out there in lies and illusions. So we break this bread in remembrance, remembering we are members of the body of Christ. And we take this communion as we commune, union, reconciled, reunited. The atonement, the atonement with God. On earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mm, love tastes good. Love sure does taste good, Denim. All right, I love you all. Appreciate you all.
Thank you all. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you like, share, subscribe, comment. Go to earthbakingvillage.com. Find uh, the uh, Awakened Spiritual Gathering in the virtual village that you can come and you can attend live on, online or you can find your way here in person. We are down here in Costa Rica, Earth Bacon Village. Um, also, we got an event coming up on Wednesday called the Off Grid Dream Life event. So just go to offgriddreamlife.com. Sign up for that event. It's Wednesday evening. It'll help you uh, find, a way, f- find your ways into the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Actually, we're establishing God's kingdom here. And so you can uh, get to experience more of that. Uh, no longer be dependent upon that sick system, the beast system that's getting rolled out right now. And so stepping into a sovereign world where sovereign children of God with sovereign food, water, shelter, energy, community, currency. And uh, also we're a nonprofit for purpose organization. You can go to uh, bridgebucksbank.com and make a donation there. That is God's uh, economy there. And so you could start sowing seeds into there where man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. Go ahead and get your treasure on the bridge to the new earth. So that's where you'll go, bridgebucksbank.com and do that. And other than that, um, love, was it? Oh, oh yeah. So it's daylights. Uh, we're um, down here in Costa Rica. <coughs> Got a little love stuck in my throat. That chip, uh, a little chip of love stuck in my throat. So we're on centered time down here. And it, <coughs> centered. We don't move. We're in centered time. We don't move down here. Up there in the U.S., it's all kind of crazy. It's not centered at all, spiraling. Times are going backwards and forwards and all kinds of crazy nuts. So we're done doing that. We're, not, we're no longer going to be swirling around the uh, swirl. We are now returning to center on centered time. So it's central standard time that just stays the same. And so we're going to be doing church at 1030 centered time, which is... Uh, 11.30 Central Time when uh, the, uh, yeah, when the time, yeah, when, when you go the, uh, when you run away from God, but when you run back towards God, 10.30 is 10.30. So y'all come on, uh, we're not coming, so if you're watching online, I'm not coming to you anymore. Y'all are coming to us, so meet us at, uh, it's 10.30 at Central, yeah, 10.30 Centered time, 10.30 Central Standard Time, and it's going to be that way forever. So uh, when it, the time changes again, you know, we don't change. We'll always be 10.30 now. So see you all next week at 10.30 Centered Time, and uh, which is now Central Time that the, the swirly people are on. Um, but other than that, love you all, appreciate you all. Who you are makes a difference. The world is a much better place because you exist Thank you for being you. Thank God for you. Thank God for us. And, uh, you know, st- stop uh, being betrayed by your own creation. Stop being kissed by Judas and allow yourself to be kissed by love. We'll see y'all next week in 30 Centered time. <laughs>